Thank you very much for that introduction. Just to, just to clarify, I'm not Jackie Dawson. <laughs> all right, well, um, I just wanted first off to say, you know, how happy I am to be here and to, and to see all of you. It's been a long time, you know, talking about this, this summit, so it's, it's really great to, uh, to actually um, have everybody together. Um, yeah, so as, as Evelyn mentioned, so I was going to talk about some Canadian contributions uh, to improving uh, coupled environmental predictions for YOP, and in particular those at Environment and Climate Change Canada. So this was uh, an effort involving many people, so I've listed a number of the, um, of the contributors here, but there are, of course, more people involved than that. Um, so I wanted to start by, by you know, going back in time a little bit, so not quite as far as Gilbert, but um, back to, say, 2012, you know, at the beginning of, of uh, Polar Prediction Project, so pre-YOP. Um, and at that time, at Environment Climate Change Canada, we had one uh, environmental prediction system, so a coupled atmosphere ice ocean forecasting system. And, um, and it was a, a coupled system for the Gulf of St. Lawrence, what you see in the, the map on the top right. Um, and, and so this system was put in place after some studies recognizing the importance of, of including a dynamic representation of the sea ice cover for the local weather forecast. So just to sort of highlight the, the process of that, I'll, I'll show a little um, a case study of a, a cold air outbreak. So we're all up to speed on cold air outbreaks after, after Ian's presentation. So if you just imagine that, but in a, a smaller context. So um, the panel on the top right shows actually the ice cover from a Canadian Ice Service daily chart. So the red is indicating a near complete ice cover. And then I'm gonna show uh, some forecasts and results from a station where the, the little star is indicated at Ramuski in, in the Lower St. Lawrence estuary. Uh, so this is a case where we had you know, fairly mild uh, winter temperatures of minus five to 10 uh, over the first 36 hours of the forecast and then temperatures dropping very rapidly over 12 hours down to minus 25. So sort of an important um, uh, cold air outbreak case. And if we look then in the, in the coupled model, we see that we get similar uh, conditions over the first 36 hours, but then this rapid drop is, uh, is diminished. Um, and um, basically what's happening here is as the winds begin to increase, we're moving ice out of the St. Lawrence estuary, allowing the ocean to release heat to the atmosphere and buffering it against the falling temperatures, um, at least locally. And if we compare that to the station data, um, then indeed we see that you know, we get a much better fit when we use the coupled model. So taking into account these, this dynamic uh, ice cover uh, really is important even for short range weather forecasts. Uh, so this was, this was uh, you know, sort of useful and, and recognized here, but of course Canada is, includes a lot more than just the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So the question was, you know, how do we expand this effort to include you know, all of Canada, in particular Canadian North, um, and in doing so, adding in these ice ocean prediction systems, um, you know, how can we use this to, to go beyond improving just the local weather forecast, but also uh, more generally other marine users. So our next step was to look at this in kind of an Arctic case. Uh, so we put together a, a global coupled model. Um, and so we looked at sort of a similar case uh, now, now in the Beaufort Sea. Uh, so you can see here the sort of synoptic situation with a, um, a low pressure system in Northeast Pacific, high pressure in the Arctic with winds blowing um, offshore. Um, and so what I'm going to show is a, an animation of the difference uh, in the ice fraction on the left and the difference in the two meter temperature on the right between a coupled and an uncoupled simulation. So I'll let this run. So what you see, the, the blue areas on the left are areas where as the winds are, are moving the ice away, we're decreasing the ice cover. Um, this is allowing, again, a release of heat to the atmosphere as a winter case, so we're, we're warming the lower atmosphere, what we can see the red area in the bottom right, um, and then this, this warm plume is getting entrained into the synoptic circulation. So at first, this was, this was very encouraging. You know, okay, we see a much of the similar process we see in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in, in the Canadian Arctic. But as we begin to dig into the problem, you know, we found that the degree to which this coastal polynia was opening uh, was very sensitive to the, to the atmosphere ice and ice ocean stresses, um, to the ice thickness presence, so whether or not the ice was able to deform as it moved offshore, also the parameterization of the, the ice strength itself within the ice model, and that these were all things that we knew poorly and were difficult to constrain. So given this, you know, it, it was quite difficult to know how to put together you know, a prediction system that would be able to reliably capture these kinds of events. So this was the kind of uh, mind frame and the, some of the sort of processes and thinking we had sort of going, in, going into YAP that we wanted to look at. So through the, the following years, then we put in place a number of prediction systems to address uh, sort of these sorts of situations and, and other priorities. Um, so these included putting together Canadian Arctic prediction systems, so a pan-Arctic high-resolution coupled forecasting systems. So we've heard this mentioned um, in a few presentations from Zen and, um, and others. Uh, we also had a, a global medium-range prediction system that's now actually operational for our three to five day uh, forecast. Coupled ensemble prediction system, um, uh, 
that goes out to 32 days and some, and some seasonal predictions. So with these, these different systems also come a number of different applications. Uh, so we developed applications with fisheries, uh, defense, uh, search and rescue, environmental emergency response, um, and of course uh, services with the Canadian Ice Service, uh, in particular with respect to the, um, the two uh, Arctic uh, med areas uh, for which uh, Canada has responsibilities, med area 17 and 18, you can see in the top right as well as uh, benefits uh, to NWP through air sea ice interactions like uh, those, those I showed earlier, as well as downstream impacts on waves and, and storm surge systems. So given the, these different systems and, and these different sort of applications, uh, so we had a number of different projects looking at you know, benefiting, uh, doing some developments to, to, in response to different user needs. So I'm gonna highlight uh, a few of those now. I wanted to start um, as an oceanographer with, uh, with the ocean. Uh, so um, we did a, uh, we have two uh, actually operational ocean analysis systems, a global system that supports the, the global deterministic and global ensemble systems, and then also a regional system um, that covers uh, sort of roughly the domain you, you see in the top right there. Um, so one of the developments we made uh, for YOP was uh, with respect to the, uh, the tidal filtering in the system. So usually ocean assimilation systems, they assimilate um, uh, satellite altimetry, so measurements of the sea surface to constrain the mesoscale circulation in the ocean. Um, and, and models that are regional models that, that usually include tides would then have to filter these tides to then compare it to the satellite data as part of the observation operator. Um, now, one of the challenges in doing so in the Arctic is that the sea ice will introduce a time-varying stress on the surface that can affect the tidal harmonics. And so we developed an online approach to remove the tides, thus allowing a, a kind of a more consistent and, and accurate use of satellite altimetry, and thus allowing us to better constrain the mesoscale and finer scale uh, features in the, in the Arctic in the system, in particular in the ice-free areas, of course. Um, we also did some ob observing the system experiments uh, using the YOP data. So if you look at the top right panels, you can see in the, in the regional and global system, re-ops re and geops, um, the panels show some errors in salinity from the systems over a, a particular analysis period. And you can see some of the brightest colors, so the largest errors are actually in the, in the Arctic basin. Um, so we wanted to see, you know, how could we use the, the observations deployed through YOP to try to improve some of these errors. Um, and uh, we also contributed some, some Argo floats, uh, you can see in the bottom left panel, um, and also make use of the Alamo floats, which are like sort of mini Argo floats deployed as part of the NOAA Arctic heat project. Um, so just to show a, a quick example of the, the impacts here. Uh, so this is a case of a rapid sea ice formation over of a period of about a week, um, so in October 2018. Um, and what the, the plots on the bottom right are showing are the sea ice uh, concentration increments after a seven-day analysis cycle. So the larger the increments, the, you know, the, the, the worse your, your, um, your trial fields were, essentially. So you can see on the, the bottom right panels, when we withhold the YOP data, these sort of bright colors in the middle of the, the black oval, whereas on the left panel, uh, we can see much sort of whiter colors in this area. So this is showing that the model is able to better capture this rapid sea ice formation event when we assimilated the YOP data. So what was going on is that the, there were errors in the, the salinity and in the, the vertical stratification in the model that were able to be corrected through the data assimilation, um, uh, essentially increasing the surface stratification, allowing a faster, more rapid um, venting of the surface uh, seasonal thermocline, and thus the rapid uh, sea ice formation event. So this was kind of a nice uh, you know, demonstration that additional in situ observations in the ice-free Arctic could have benefits for important applications like rapid sea ice formation. So a uh, priority uh, that, was, that was noted uh, pre-op was uh, to be able to have a higher resolution sea ice analyses. Um, so there is uh, an effort to, to develop an ice concentration retrieval approach using th synthetic aperture radar data. So this used initially images from RadarSat 2, um, and then more recently with the advent of the RadarSat Constellation mission, RCM, uh, the, the system was modified for that. And, and the, the approach developed used a, a kind of a multi-scale approach, so it could uh, have sort of a finer scale, 200 meter um, resolution when reliable statistics could be obtained, and then upscaled to a, a lower resolution um, uh, analysis when, when it was less reliable. So you can see an example of that here. So the panel on the left uh, shows the SAR imagery, so you can see in green the areas of open water, and then the white areas of ice. And then you can see then in the, in the red areas the extent to which the, the system is able to capture um, uh, that, that ice concentration, including some of the smaller filamentary structures, um, which are often the kinds of things that can be very important to shipping and that we'd want to have in our, our, our prediction systems. 
Um, you can see here now a verification looking at the improvement of percentage correct total um, in the, the system with the SAR analysis versus our control. And also as a reference uh, run using the sea ice charts, so simulating the ice charts, the manual ice charts versus uh, the control. And then the two of them combined in the right panel. So red areas are areas of improvement. So you can see in the left panel uh, using the SAR data, we're getting some significant improvements basically throughout the Ar Arctic and, and around Alaska. Whereas the, the benefit of the ice charts is really uh, more in the areas for which the ice surface is concentrating their efforts, so in kind of regional Canadian waters. Um, and the maximum benefit is obtained when we, when we put the two together. So this was, this was kind of a nice demonstration that the SAR data does have a, a significant impact um, and can extend the kinds of impacts we see from the, the charts, but over the full Arctic. Um, we've also been working on uh, developing some, some products based on the SAR. So this is uh, a product using the ice, ice tracking system. So it looks at successive images and from those estimates uh, drift velocity. And then from these drift velocities, we can calculate deformation statistics, so shear, divergence, vorticity. Um, so for those who might be familiar, it's, it's similar uh, to the RGPS product that, that uh, ended a number of years ago. And as you can see an example on the right panel here showing the, the shear rate uh, um, composite over a month of December 2020. As you can see, it gives a, a fairly, um, fairly full coverage, um, and you can see a lot of the in yellow there, some of the little lines showing the, the shear features. So this is, is quite important and useful to, um, to be able to understand better, uh, you know, what these features look like and, uh, and their variability, but then, of course, also to be able to verify these features uh, in, in our models and predictions. Another priority uh, that was, was noted early on was the development of the need for, for ice thickness analyses, uh, so various studies that show the benefits of uh, constraining the ice thickness uh, for longer range uh, sea ice forecasts. Um, so we developed a combined SMOS cryosat ice thickness uh, product, so SMOS for the thinner ice, cryosat 2 for the thicker ice, um, using a 3D VAR approach on a five kilometer grid. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, this was uh, seen to be helpful for some areas of overly thin ice uh, in our model. So you can see in the, the bottom plots on the left, we have our regional ice ocean system re-ops, and then in the, in the center is a 3D VAR analysis. So you can see the areas of thicker color in the, in the, in the warmer colors north of the archipelago, and then in the central Arctic, we can see the ice thins out, uh, a little bit too much so perhaps in re-ops. Um, we can see this when we compare with NASA IceBridge uh, measurements on the, on the bottom right, where we see the measurements in black. Um, and in particular, if you look towards the middle of the plot, you can see the re-ops values in the blue line drop below the observations, whereas the 3D VAR analysis using cryosat data falls more or less uh, towards the middle of the black line. So fairly good. Uh, but when we move to the left side of that plot, when we're closer to the archipelago, you can see that the analysis and the model are actually quite similar. This brings me now to CAPS. So we've heard about CAPS, but uh, maybe not had too much of it explained to you yet. So CAPS uh, is a system uh, that was really built to, to look at some of these fine scale interactions um, that I was, I was discussing for the Gulf St. Lawrence system, um, uh, but also you know, to put out there for, for community support to look at this you know, more broadly across the Arctic. And so the way the system was constructed is it uses this, this re-op system I mentioned, so the, the plot we see on the bottom right, that includes the Atlantic, the Arctic, and also the North Pacific. And then to couple on top of this, a three kilometer pan-Arctic grid um, for the atmosphere. Um, so the system that was put in place January 2018, uh, it was coupled shortly after that, and then uh, just uh, was discontinued uh, not too long ago. Uh, so I said uh, one of our interests with the system is looking at sort of the, the importance of small scale uh, interactions. Uh, so one of the areas we see this is with respect to orographic features. Um, so this plot shows uh, a case with a, a strong flow over, over Baffin Island into, into Baffin Bay. Um, and we can see the flow lines superimposed on the, uh, the near surface temperatures. And we can see how the flow is being diverted through uh, various, various fjords, creating these, these jet structures blowing into Baffin Bay, um, which would have um, potential impacts for the sea ice cover in terms of creating coastal polynias um, and uh, impacting the sea ice drift, um, and also, also through the, the, the variations in the surface temperature. Um, we can also see some similar features, as I mentioned, in uh, Beaufort Sea, but now at finer resolution. So in the previous example, it was at 33 kilometer resolution in the atmosphere, and now we're at three. 
Um, and so we can see not only are we seeing the big uh, the impact of large polynias, but we even see the effect of, of small scale um, cracks in the ice. So the bottom right panel, uh, you can see those little blue lines are actually leads opening up in the ice. And then on the left panel, you can see the direct impact of those on the, on the near surface temperatures. Um, so clearly, a, you know, strong inter coupled interactions even on, on fine scales. Um, so there's some work done uh, by Barbara Cassati and others looking at the verification of these. Um, uh, so this is an example showing some comparison with CAPS, our regional forecasts and the global forecasts. Uh, CAPS is shown here in red. You can see for both the bias and the standard deviation, we see some benefits uh, with, uh, for Canadian stations at least uh, for the near surface temperature, dew point and, and wind speed. Uh, I should mention that there are you know, more detailed results in a, in a paper uh, submitted by Barbara and also one by Morton Calzow published a couple of years ago. Um, one of the things we wanted to do with CAPS as well was look at developing new products. Um, so in discussions with, with industry and others, um, you know, we had some ideas about looking at you know, the internal ice pressure, the tendency of the pressure, shear rate, some, some different values. So we put together uh, to an automated generation of some images. We see an example here on the right. Um, and then these were sent in near real time to an FTP server for use on the Polar Stern for um, you know, helping look at uh, scientific planning and seeing if, if this sort of imagery could be, could be useful um, on the ships. So you can see the images were roughly centered around the Polar Stern. You, you see marked in the top right panel is a little red dot. So we had a, a kind of wide view uh, was shown here, um, but there's also a, a zoom uh, view what's in this plot. And the example I'm showing here is for November 15th, which is kind of a notable date uh, for those in the room, I think, who were on the Polar Stern. will remember this was just preceding a significant storm um, that went over the, the location of the Polar Stern on the 17th. So if you look at the difference in the plots between prior to the storm here and now with the storm, you can see the significant increase in the wind speed in the, the top left plot, the sea ice drift in the top right. Um, and in the bottom right, you can see now, you know, significant increases in, in positive divergence. So risk of opening up leads um, around on the polar stern. And indeed, um, you know, I believe there was a, a large lead that opened up between the polar stern and the on ice camps, you know, providing, you know, obviously some very serious hazardous uh, situations for, for gear and, and personnel. So I think this highlighted the, the potential usefulness of these sorts of, of products for, for field campaigns. This brings me now to our, our global ensemble prediction system. So um, this was developed uh, really in response to discussions with the Canadian Ice Service uh, that they were saying that, you know, we, we were working a lot with the, with the regional ice ocean system and they were saying, you know, that's great, but what we really need is help with the long range. You know, the week three and four, we really have difficulty, you know, knowing, you know, how to produce forecasts. That's what the users are asking for. And so initially we put in place an ice ocean system. And based on the success of that, then we, we took the next step, coupled it into the atmosphere, and the system's actually fully operational now, providing weekly 32-day coupled forecasts with 21 members. Um, one of the challenges in developing the system was uh, in terms of the verification metrics. So the, the CI verification tools at hand at the time really were making it difficult to understand, you know, whether the system was, was providing useful skill in different areas. And, and, you know, we really wanted to have that reliability before, you know, giving it to the ICE service. Um, and so the developments made by, by Helga Gosling and others in terms of the integrated ice extent error and the uh, probabilistic extension of that, the, the stochastic probability score, were really very useful in that regard. So on the right panel, I've showed the, um, the SPS scores for the, uh, the ensemble system in red, our deterministic coupled system in blue, and the um, and persistence in green as, as a kind of a reference. And so you can see throughout the year that the ensemble system is providing a benefit with respect to the deterministic system, despite the fact that it, it's slightly lower resolution and it's initialized with a single analysis. So it's clear that the system is going to be under dispersive because it's only generating its, its spread as, as the forecast goes forward. But despite that, it's still able to provide some, some significant benefit um, and also a benefit with respect to persistence throughout the year, whereas the deterministic system shows some uh, potential difficulties in the, in the kind of melt season um, around June, July. Um, so an additional uh, benefit that can be made is, is not just trying to bias correct these kinds of forecasts, but actually to do a kind of a calibration of them. Um, so there was a method put together by Arlen Dirksen and others um, uh, using a censored Gaussian calibration approach. 
uh, to look at this. There's some results on the left pot showing the impact uh, in the percent improvement of the spatial probability score um, of the calibration both for our JEP system and also the CMW FCs 5. Um, and so it's sort of a busy pot here, but if you just look at the sort of the green and the kind of purplish circles, um, you can see that we're getting values of 40 to 50 percent improvement in SPS with the calibration, and that these are much bigger than what you get with just bias correction alone. Um, on the right, there's an animation showing the, the different days of a particular forecast. You can see it just reset now. So at the beginning, you can see on the left panel, there's not much spread because, as I said, we started with a single analysis. Um, but using the calibration, we're able to correct that uh, to some extent. And then as it, as it goes on, you can see that um, in the calibrated product, we're providing a much more kind of diffuse and, and reliable uh, sea ice probability uh, from the forecast. Uh, so this brings me now um, to uh, a YOP endorsed project. So this was a project uh, that came out of a, a targeted funding call by MIOPAR and Polar Knowledge Canada. Um, as a project called Forecasting Regional Arctic Sea Ice from Months to a Season um, that we were involved in. Uh, so it really was aiming to investigate uh, sources of Arctic sea ice predictability, um, looking on kind of slightly longer time scales, and develop user relevant uh, forecast products for this. Um, and, the, and this was this was actually part of the Arctic Climate Forum as well. So I think that was quite a useful uh, user engagement. Uh, so just a few examples of that are shown here. Um, so there are some particular efforts to look at things like the, the freeze update, um, both in a deterministic sense and a probabilistic sense, um, looking at uh, you know different probabilities of ice, um, also the potential benefits uh, of, of taking a multi-model approach. Um, so there's a, a presentation, I think, tomorrow that on the, um, the Arctic Climate Forum, for, if you want more information on that. Um, so it brings me now to, um, to my summary. So, um, so a, a number of outcomes from YOP I wanted to, I wanted to highlight here. So, so first off, uh, we made various improvements to our, to our ocean and sea ice analyses. So there's the online tidal harmonic analysis to account for um, non-stationary tides, also some observing system experiments. Um, to look at the benefits of uh, profile observations in the ice-free Arctic. Various improvements to our, our ice analyses, including um, automated SAR retrievals for ice concentration and an ice thickness product. There are a number of improvements to the sea ice model physics. I didn't, I didn't say anything about this. Uh, we have a presentation by Jean-Francois Lemieux uh, this afternoon where he'll be talking more about this, the landfast ice parameterization and also uh, improvements to the sea ice rheology. So please uh, go have a look at that if you're interested. Um, uh, so one of the, the main uh, activities was putting in place this CAP system, so our high-resolution Pan-Arctic couple prediction system. Um, so we heard a bit about that in some different presentations uh, and in Barbara's presentation. Um, and I just note that the, the data is, is available for others who would who'd like to look at, um, at those. So one of our, our other big um, uh, focuses was on this global ensemble prediction system um, for which there are now new calibrated products uh, going into the Canadian Ice Service as well. I should mention that Drew Peterson has a talk on that this afternoon as well. Um, and we made some contributions to the Arctic Climate Forum, which I think was, was you know, a big step forward in being able to, you know, to bridge that gap between kind of research forecasts on sea ice, long range forecasts, and what the users actually need. Um, so I think that was a, a very beneficial um, outcome as well. And there were some improvements also to some of the NWB products and to some of the, the atmosphere aspects I didn't talk too much about. Um, uh, for example, you might have seen the presentation by, by Bill yesterday. So just before I finish, I just wanted to say a couple words about key challenges going forward. Um, so the first, I think, is really to, to increase our understanding of polar dynamic and physical processes. So we, we've heard a lot about that from, from Ganilla this morning um, uh, and, um, and um, you know, there's a presentation yesterday on this as well. You know, and I think this is important, you know, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the things we often hear from users um, is, is the need to have, you know, better estimates of uncertainty in our forecasts, right? And, and so there's a move towards, you know, having probabilistic forecasts as an estimate um, of that uncertainty, but we have to be sure that, the, you know, the spread in the ensemble is representative of the inherent uncertainty. Um, and, and understanding the uncertainty in the physical processes to then get a reliable spread, I think, is really key. Um, and I think the presentation yesterday, I mean, touched on that a little bit, um, but I think there's, there's a lot more to do in terms of really understanding the processes, how to, how to you know, you know, perturb or uh, characterize that uncertainty in our systems to get the, the right uncertainty in the forecast. Uh, the second point is uh, is with respect to the um, the observer or observing system. 
Um, so it was really great to see in, in Francois' presentation yesterday some like really clear outcomes in terms of the, um, the observing system. You know, I think there, there's still work to do, uh, in particular um, in the, in the, the ocean and, and the sea ice aspects um, to understand how to best observe the system, especially in light of, of new observing types going in, um, you know, gliders, autonomous um, areas, taking advantage of the fact that we do have much larger open water areas in the Arctic. So this changes a little bit the paradigm of how we're assimilating the data, you know, for, for satellite altimetry for the ocean, for example. We have much more data than we ever had in the past. So how we can make use of all of this and make use of it perhaps even in, in coupled contexts for coupled data assimilation, um, I think will be a, a big challenge going forward. Um, so with that, I'll end there. Thanks for your attention and uh, I'll take any questions you have. Hi, Greg. Thanks Hi. for the talk. Appreciate it. Uh, I was curious about your uh, combined Crysat 2S MOS product. Uh, I'm excited to know that you're, you're doing one at Environment Canada a couple years back. I wanted to look in a similar data set and ended up using the AVI um, equivalent. So I was just curious about, like, um, are there, did you compare the two, your, your thickness analysis and uh, what they're doing at AVI, and are there any major differences in, I don't know, in the, the, the product like stream and, and way that you process this analysis? and uh, did you compare the, the resulting thicknesses? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still a product that's, that's under development, so it's not finished. So there are some different you know, comparisons that are undergoing. I'm not sure we've compared specifically to that product, but it, I think it probably would be something that's, that, that would be interesting to, to see. Um, uh, you know, it, it depends too, it, you know, a little bit how the, the products are put together for the application. I mean, ours, we really want to work towards integrating the data into the model, right? So it depends too if you're looking at kind of L4 products versus, you know, something that would be assimilating directly into the system. So, you know, sometimes it's a little bit apples and oranges, but. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Looking forward to this. Very cool. Thank you. Is it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, move on to the next talk now. Sorry, Johnny. Well, we have one question. Okay. That's all, um, Quick one. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say, I think Environment ca and Climate Change Canada is quite unusual in being in, in running both a sort of a coupled high resolution regional forecasting system and a global one. Um, and I, would, I was wondering if there are any sort of any things that, from running that the like high resolution regional system. Uh, or any things that you've sort of found that like, worked really well there that you've been able to sort of, uh, you know, lessons you've learned from that that you've been able to adopt at the, uh, for the global system. Yeah, well, I think you're right that we came at it from a different direction. A lot of systems come at it more from a climate, you know, take a kind of a climate coupling perspective. So, I mean, you know, one of the first things was that we were coupling every time step. Right, initially. So we had a regional context, you know, it's heavier to do all of those exchanges, but it was something we saw because the sea ice was moving so quickly that, you know, a lot of the sort of more in the climate paradigm is that you want to capture sort of maybe slower variations and sea surface temperature or these sorts of things. But with the sea ice, it can actually change very rapidly. You know, you can have sea ice forming over a day. Um, I know uh, in the St. Lawrence estuary, you know, I, I spent a, a year working there in, in Ramuski, and in the morning on my drive to work, it would be fully covered with ice, and on the way home, the ice would be all gone, right? It, you know, it can change very quickly, um, and so being able to capture that in the model can be very important. What's tricky then is in a global context is, is seeing the impact of these things, right? Because if you, you, know, you pull out your standard verification package, you're gonna be carrying, comparing against lots of stations and, and a lot of the detail gets washed out, right? So it, it really comes down to having those local stations and it's where we're a little bit lucky in that we have areas with the sea ice cover, uh, like in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but also a lot of station data around it so we can see these sorts of impacts. Whereas in the Arctic, you just don't have is the, that high density of a observation network. So I'd encourage everybody to look at uh, evaluating their models using the Gulf of St. Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I will not waste my time repeating my introduction. We'll go directly to Jackie's presentation, which will be virtual. Okay, can you, can you, can you hear me now? You can, okay. I'm getting a chat from Danielle. I'll just share, share.